set up the Human Rights Collegium about five years ago to focus on the rights of the vulnerable and the human rights of the marginalised. Um, and currently we're running a project on should the United Kingdom incorporate a right to food, something beyond uh, food banks. And we've commissioned plays on child refugees and as well as our distinguished speaker tonight, We've had distinguished speakers such as uh, Albie Sachs, some of you may have come from, uh, the uh, British judge on the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, together with our partner, the British Institute of Human Rights, uh, we offer training uh, on how you become a human rights lawyer when you're working in civil society, non-governmental organisations. And we also publish uh, freely online the Queen Mary Human Rights Law Review which uh, Susan's uh, lecture will also be uh, appearing in. And I'm absolutely uh, delighted to welcome tonight uh, Susan Herman. Uh, she probably needs no introduction, but she's going to get one uh, anyway. <laughs> she is uh, president of the American Civil Liberties Union. Before that, she was general counsel uh, of the ACLU, which meant she focused uh, the ACLU's attention on which areas uh, to uh, litigate on in relation to protecting uh, individual rights against uh, government uh, encroachment. And in her spare time, uh, if she has any spare time, uh, she's also the Centennial Professor of Law at uh, Brooklyn uh, Law School. And uh, she teaches constitutional law and also, interestingly, uh, law and literature. And uh, her most recent book, which I, I really recommend to you, uh, it's called Taking Liberties, The War on Terror and the Erosion of American Democracy. And it deservedly won the uh, Roy C. Parker Civil Liberties Prize. So we're delighted you can be with us. Uh, we're looking forward to what you have to say. And the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Geraldine, for the lovely introduction and for the invitation. I'm delighted to be with you all here tonight. Um, in part, it's sort of nice to be out of my country for a little bit right now. <laughs> uh, you may know the ACLU has been around for 97 years. So when people say, well, how are you ready to start you know, suing the Trump administration so quickly? I say to them, we've been practicing for 97 years. <laughs> and we work in 14 different areas, which I'll show you later, where I'll invite you to ask questions on behalf of many you know, poor and marginalized groups. Uh, and we've been busy because uh, it seems that the Trump administration also works in 14 different areas, just in the opposite direction. So since the inauguration, we have brought 109 lawsuits about yeah, immigrants' rights, uh, defending transgender people, reproductive freedom, you know, on down the line, so many things. We also have had a, about a million new members since the election of people who really want to see some fighting back there. And what I thought I would do tonight, lately my speeches have been, you know, people just want to know what are you doing about the Trump administration and tell us the stories and give us the examples. And I've taken to calling speeches, can he do that? Because, <laughs> you know, that's what people want to know. But I thought that given the theme of your collegium on um, human rights and inequality, I thought that I would use the occasion of my main speech to try to go a little bit deeper than just, you know, what are the rights and how are we fighting back? And to try to look at the whole question of how did a country where a majority of people very much believe in human rights and our fundamental values expressed in our constitution and all sorts of other places are really pro-rights, pro-liberty, how did we get to the position where our White House is now a black hole for civil liberties and human rights? Um, I thought that an interesting place to start, we were talking about the title of my talk, and I named the talk Liberty, Equality, and Fraternity because I thought it might be interesting to think all together about how countries define and frame their national values, uh, what that means in terms of what the expression of the values means for how we actually act, and then sort of the final question of how you reconcile your national values with what you actually do, you know, not just the, the words but the deeds. So to start out, uh, probably the um, there, there we go. Okay. Why am I not getting the... I'm getting dings, but it's not moving forward here. There, okay, now we got it. Okay, so probably the most uh, famous expression of human values is the French slogan, Liber Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, which they're very fond of chiseling into buildings. This is my own picture from last summer, so don't criticize the quality. So Liberty, Equality, Fraternity is a very prominent statement of national values and national goals. 
Uh, the United States version of what we chisel on our buildings, this is the Supreme Court building, equal justice under law, we say. Whether we always do it is, of course, another question. But the, probably the most widespread uh, acknowledgement of values is what everyone has to say, school children, uh, football players, everybody else, when they pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic for which it stands with liberty and justice for all. So we say of ourselves that we believe in liberty and justice for all. Uh, I'm sure you know about the controversy about Colin Kaepernick and the other National Football League players who have declined to pledge allegiance to the flag because they don't actually feel that the United States at this point stands for liberty and justice for all, especially in terms of police conduct. So that's an ongoing controversy that maybe we'll say more about later. Another expression of our fundamental values in the Declaration of Independence, when we got free from you, from you guys, uh, mentions life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and sort of nods to equality. It says along the way, all men are created equal. That didn't end up in the Constitution, which has no guarantee of equality at all, the original Constitution. And you'll notice there's certainly no mention of fraternity. So I was trying to think, you know, as a visitor to the UK, of what's the place where you kind of inscribe on a building your national values? And you don't seem to do that much. So you seem to believe in symbols more than words. So that's the best I could come up with. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, liberty, uh, the basis of it all. So um, what I want to start with, I want to sort of, you know, have a couple of propositions for you tonight. So liberty, equality, fraternity, liberty and justice for all, et cetera. Americans are good at liberty. That's the place where our, where our deeds come closest to matching our words. And um, talking about that, I will start with the First Amendment to our Constitution. This is the first provision in the Bill of Rights, where the Constitution makes a very strong statement about the individual's right of conscience, the individual's right to decide on their own religion, their own speech, uh, the right of assembly, and the right of freedom of the press. And the whole idea there is it's a kind of a statement of individualism and the relationship of the individual with the state, that the state can't tell us what we should say, what we should believe, what religion we should be uh, when we want to you know, protest something, because that is the individual's decision. Now, if I were doing for you a history of the ACLU since 1920, what I would be talking about is the fact that we were founded in part in order to protect freedom of speech, because during World War I, just before the ACLU was founded, there were a number of people who were criminally prosecuted and convicted for dissenting speech. People who actually served time in prison because they argued that they didn't think the draft was fair or they didn't like the war. Now that's something that's surprising to including a lot of Americans who are accustomed to the fact that our Supreme Court now is highly protective of free speech. But that didn't happen all by itself. The ACLU slogan is because freedom can't defend itself. And there are many, many cases that we litigated in the first half of the 20th century to get from World War I, where people could be prosecuted for saying things that were unpatriotic, unpopular, to World War II, when the Supreme Court uh, decided a remarkable case, West Virginia versus Barnett. In 1943, there were these school children in West Virginia who declined to salute the flag. They would not pledge allegiance to the flag because their family were Jehovah's Witnesses. And what their parents taught them was that you don't pledge allegiance to a flag or a government. Your allegiance is only for God. And so that's what their parents taught them. Uh, because the little girls refused to pledge allegiance to the flag in the middle of World War II, you can imagine what their neighbors in West Virginia thought of this, the little girls were suspended and some bright person then went after their parents for the fact that their children were truant. So amazingly, in 1943, the Supreme Court decided a case saying they have a right to decline to pledge allegiance to the flag. And there are great quotes about how the government can't tell you what to, you know, what to think and what to do. Um, the opinion there was by Robert Jackson, who well, you may, some of you may know was the prosecutor in the Nuremberg trials. So it's a remarkable statement about the First Amendment and a remarkable idea that you know, the government cannot require orthodoxy. In terms of the flag that we pledge allegiance to, uh, Texas versus Johnson in 1989 um, also decided um, on behalf of Mr. Johnson who wanted to protest by burning a flag. And he was prosecuted and convicted of a crime in Texas because he had shown disrespect for the flag. And the Supreme Court reversed his conviction. And they said, no, the First Amendment means he has the right to protest however he wants. And the flag, you know, let's not fetishize the flag. If he wants to protest by burning a flag, he can protest in that way. 
Okay, uh, perhaps the most recent interesting example of how seriously Americans take liberty, I'm sure you've all heard about the demonstration in Charlottesville by neo-Nazis that ended up turning violent. But people often ask me, one of the most common questions that I get after I speak is people say to me, well, what's the ACLU's position on hate speech? And I tell them, and we can talk about that during the Q&A if you want, hate speech is speech. If you start saying to people, you can say whatever you want, but you can't say that, yeah, where does that end? Everybody's that is gonna be something different. And so the ACLU is criticized from both sides because we actually do support the right of neo-Nazis or anybody else, Black Lives Matter, anybody to say what they want. And we don't think the government should be able to say, you can say that and you can't say that. Okay, so that's our idea of the importance of speech. Compare that to France. France has hate speech laws. I don't know if you've run across this, but you very often in the newspapers will read about whether um, people are going to be prosecuted for having an anti-Israel, you know, or Israel boycott, you know, pro-Israel boycott, anti-Israel boycott. Um, they've said something homophobic. They've said something anti-Muslim or anti-whatever, because the French hate speech laws make it a crime. You can be prosecuted for um, making comments that are insulting to an individual or group based on race, gender, sexual orientation, etc., or inviting discrimination. So the French don't always prosecute people, but they, if that in fact is considered a crime in France, as is denying the existence of the Holocaust, that also is a crime. It could get you prosecuted in France. Uh, so again, all sorts of discussion here. Uh, the hate, hate speech laws have recently been uh, ramped up in this headline for transphobia offenders. And there was one recent story I, I was reading in terms of the slippery slope, this goes both ways, of somebody who was um, considered for prosecution because they had called somebody else a homophobe. And that was considered insulting. So again, um, Francis' ideas about hate speech laws. Similarly, in the United States, our idea of freedom of religion is that everybody should be free to express their religious beliefs. This is about Muslim women, just because those are recent cases about whether Muslim women can wear a hijab you know, on the job or, or you know, in different kinds of contexts. And this, uh, the American courts are very good on saying that people have the right to express their religion in the public square. You can wear your headscarf, you can wear your yarmulke, you can wear your rosary beads, whatever it is you want to wear. And the ACLU has brought quite a number of cases on that, the idea that the, your freedom, your freedom of religion, means you get to express who you are. Again, compare France. They don't always follow through, but I'm sure you've all read about the town that wanted to bur ban the burkinis, the laws saying you can't wear your headscarf in the public square. And my sense of what's going on in France is when you talk to, has anybody have occasion to talk to French people about what this is all about? Right, what they tell you is that what's most important if you're a French is you have to be French. You shouldn't be setting yourself apart as Muslim and French, you're French. And it's a sense of community. So that to me is, I think, what the French take fraternity to mean. There's this value that sometimes actually pushes against liberty. The need of the community to have common values, to have a consistent tradition and you know, consistent um, you know, values that they share. So I've always thought of fraternity as something that's just really not on the American screen. You know, we think about liberty a lot, and we're pretty good at liberty. Um, but in France, there is this value that, that kind of you know, t can take you in the other direction. So the, vali the value is the liberty, equality, fraternity. This makes me think that you know, maybe sometimes, maybe you have to choose among those values. You know, can you really have all three at once? And if you do you know, have to choose, how do you prioritize? So very nice to say liberty, equality, fraternity, but what do you do when you feel that there's a conflict between two of your goals? A couple of other examples of the United States being very good at personal liberty, sometimes with very negative consequences. <coughs> Our Supreme Court has said that the Second Amendment to the Constitution, one right after the first, which talks about a right to bear arms, creates an individual right to carry weapons, and which that therefore makes it very difficult to have reasonable gun control laws. And I'm sure you all know about the results. We've had all sorts of mass shootings in the United States, because again, there's this liberty, this individualism is being valued. But sometimes there are very positive consequences, as in the Supreme Court, sort of pretty recently, deciding in a bunch of ACLU cases and others, that people should have the right to live their lives the way they want to live them, regardless of what all their neighbors think. So same-sex marriage uh, for these two men and these two women was something that the Supreme Court recently declared to be an important liberty. Okay, so there things stood. We're kind of pretty good at liberty. The Trump administration is now pushing back on liberty in a number of different ways, reproductive freedom in particular. 
a number of other examples that I could show you. But if you look at the attitudes of the American people, I know you're not going to be able to read all this, but you can read the top left, widespread disapproval of Trump's signature policy proposals. The gold columns, which are much larger than the green columns, are the people who disapprove. So again, if people tell you, you know, this is America now, it's not. You know, most people really disapprove of, you know, the transgender ban, um, the cruel to immigrants uh, project, etc. So, um, how does Trump get to be president if a majority of people disagree with most of what he wants to do? Well, proposition number two, I told you the United States is pretty good at liberty. We're not so good at equality. Equality was not mentioned in the in initial constitution, and under the original constitution, only white men with property were the voters. That's who got to vote. So I want to talk to you about three different kinds of inequality that the Constitution either gives rise to or allows, which I think explain why Donald Trump is now in the White House. The first is democratic inequality. Now, when the United States was designed, there were a lot of powerful states that were used to being autonomous. And when the structures of the government were designed, there was a compromise that needed to be made in order to form the union between the powerful states that didn't want to give up too much autonomy and the rights of the people throughout the United States. So the preamble to the Constitution begins, we the people are forming this government. But in fact, a lot of the Constitution was based on kind of we the states and what the states got to decide to do. So if you've ever studied this, the United States Congress is made up of two different houses. The House of Representatives was elected directly by the people, so that's popular vote. The Senate, the other house, originally the senators from each state were to be appointed by the state legislatures. So that was state power. That then changed a little later on in the 17th Amendment. But the other thing you may have heard of that is also anti-democratic is the Electoral College. So this again was something of a compromise that the president was going to be selected not by the people voting, but by electors appointed by each state. Now what a lot of Americans even don't know is that under this provision of the Constitution, if the states did not want to allow people to vote for president, they didn't have to. The state legislatures could have chosen the electors for president. So it's not a democratic election, you're deciding who should be president. Now, there were a number of different factors that led to the adoption of the Electoral College, but one of them, um, you know, James Madison of Virginia arguing strongly for this manner of uh, selecting president, was to try to give an advantage to some of the states that had a lot of people who didn't count as voters because they weren't allowed to vote because they were slaves. So the Electoral College, I think, has its roots in slavery. It also has its roots in tremendous democratic inequality because it makes the power of the votes of people in a less populous state like Wyoming far more valuable than the vo votes of people in a more populous state like California or New York. So there's, you probably saw this the, after the 2016 election. That's the electoral map that got Donald Trump elected. Okay, so when you just glance at it, it looks like, oh my goodness, he won most of the country. Well, you may also know right down here that Hillary Clinton actually won the popular vote by about three million votes. How could that be given this map? Well, you look at California and New York in particular, two very populous states, which are democratic. They have you know, a tremendous amount of population. And then you look at all these other states. California has 55 electoral votes. New York has 29. Uh, Utah has six. Wyoming has three. North Dakota has three. So you have to add up a whole lot of states to get to Donald Trump getting to be president by having a majority of electors in the Electoral College. Um, I think the Electoral College is a problem. A lot of people after the, this election sort of noticed the Electoral College and said, oh, maybe we should do something about that. And the um, reaction was, well, you're being so partisan. It's just because a Republican was elected that the Democrats are fighting that. Well, the ACLU has been opposing the Electoral College for 50 years. And we're nonpartisan, you know, whether Republicans or Democrats are elected, we think that the president should be elected by a majority of people. So if you're interested, I wrote a piece that was in the Huffington Post about the fact that it's really not possible to amend the Constitution to get rid of the Electoral College. Why not? The process of amending the United States Constitution is that any amendment would have to be approved by three quarters of the states. Is that going to happen? Okay, look at how many states there are. Again, it's kind of an anti-democratic provision because it looks at the number of states and not the number of people. So we, um, I think we're not going to be getting rid of the Electoral College anytime soon. But if you think about that, there is baked right into the Constitution, there's this inequality already. 
and the way that Donald Trump got to be elected and got to be the president of maybe you know 40 percent of the people when in fact most of the people in the country do not agree with his positions. Okay, so that's one um, anti-democratic provision of the Constitution. There are others. So another part of the compromise with the powerful states is that the states were allowed to decide who was going to get to vote in federal as well as state elections. That's what the first paragraph says in a complicated way. And the second paragraph tells us that uh, the time, places, and manner of holding elections shall be prescribed by, in each state by the legislature. It allows Congress to overrule some of those and make national law, but for the most part, the idea was that the states could decide all the important things about federal elections. So what did the states decide? Well, one thing they get to decide is what the congressional districts will be. So this is North Carolina, and the different pink, uh, blue, and yellow show here three different maps that you might have of what the congressional districts in North Carolina could look like. If you do map number one, which is what the Republicans in, who took over the, um, both houses in the North Carolina legislature voted into office, even though the state is just about 50-50 Democrat and Republican, map number one le yields you 10 Republican representatives and three Democrats. Map number two, if the Democrats were in power, would, would yield you nine Democratic representatives and four Republicans. And map three, a hypothetical nonpartisan map, would lead you about just about equal with a few wild cards. OK, so one of the things that the Republicans have done, because they are now in control of the legislatures of most states, is they have used gerrymandering to put a thumb on the scale. OK, so number one, the states have increasing you know, this additional power under the Electoral College. Wyoming and you know, other states have more than their share of the power. And then they can use the power to disadvantage whoever is out of power. OK, so the ins get to you know, make the rules and put thumbs on the scale and get more power because the states are given that right. This is Wisconsin, which was one of the states that was very much up for grabs. And the Wisconsin state legislature, again, did, did being starting out being just about half and half Republicans and Democrats, there are somewhat fewer Democrats in Wisconsin than there used to be, Democratic voters, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But if you look at the proportion between the population of the state and the, popu the, the population of Democrats and the number of assembly seats going to Democrats, the disparity keeps increasing. So again, by allowing the states to make their own rules about setting the districts and how the districts are going to be drawn, there's a tremendous amount of democratic disproportion, and you end up with each state sending its electoral votes to somebody who was not the choice of the majority of people in the states, in the electoral college, or in Congress, you just end up with a disproportionate number of, of uh, Republicans to Democrats. Could be the other way if the Democrats were in charge, but at the moment it's the Republicans. There is a case currently pending in the Supreme Court challenging partisan gerrymandering. Uh, it's possible that the court might say something, but they're not going to do all that much. They're not going to radically change this formula. So what that means is that in order to have political change, you really need a super majority of people in the country, not just a majority, in order to vote for somebody other than Donald Trump or people other than the people who we now have in the House or the Senate. A second, um, well, you know, the, the other thing I would say is that if you were really serious about wanting everybody to vote, there would be a lot of ways you could do that. You could make election day a holiday. You could just make voting really easy. And we haven't done that. And a lot of the reason for that is that Congress has not really uh, played too much of a role. Are we having a problem with sound or something? Oh, <laughs> I didn't even notice that. It's on the screen. Um, OK. So this slide you don't need to see very much. It's just, you know, well, somebody looks at this. It's just a slide of people lining up to vote on election day. Um, is <laughs> okay, well, we're, while we're waiting here, uh, my, the next slide, which you couldn't see, uh, the next thing I want to tell you about is after democratic inequality, a second problem that we have under the Constitution and how it's been interpreted is with racial inequality. And a lot of these inequities in voting that I'm telling you about can be directly traceable back to slavery. Uh, we'll skip over that. So the Constitution, when it started out, I was telling you there was no provision for equality. 
Uh, there was also a number of provisions in the Constitution actually condoned slavery. You may have heard about the three-fifths clause, and there were a number of ways in which the Constitution kicked the can of, on the issue you know, down the road because they didn't want to agree. They agreed that the states could decide for themselves whether or not to enslave people. Um, after the Civil War, there were a number of amendments added to the Constitution that prohibited slavery, that said that there should be equal protection of the laws, and also in the 15th Amendment gave people the right to vote regardless of their color. So this, the states in which uh, slaves had been held were told that they could not any longer prohibit people who were enslaved, oh there we go, uh, enslaved from voting. So uh, what the states did with that power is under the Jim Crow laws is they thought of all sorts of ways to, pre to pre prevent the freed slaves from voting. You may have heard of the grandfather clause. Have you ever heard that term? the grandfather clause. Well, what a number of states had a law that actually said, in order to be able to vote in Alabama, you have to show that your grandfather voted. <laughs> Who didn't that apply to? Okay, so this is a wheel that we saw um, from, uh, when we went to the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee, which is really very interesting. I don't know how much of it you can read here, but every single compartment, you spin the wheel and you get something like, you underline the answer to question number four, instead of circling it, your registration is denied. You forgot to bring a birth certificate or affidavit as proof you're over 21, you can't register today. Uh, you can't find the registrar's office, which changes location every month, you can't register today. Uh, you are told that your family will be evicted from your home if you register today, you leave without registering. So what the southern states did was even though the 15th Amendment had required them to offer the right to vote to everybody regardless of race, they actually managed to discourage or downright prevent any number of the freed slaves from voting because they did not want the political power to be shifted from the white people in the state to the now freed slaves. So is that a piece of a thing of the past? Well, one uh, very nice chapter here is that Congress did step in and pass a national law in the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Any of you heard of Selma or seen the film? Okay, so this was the right that came, uh, the, the bill that came after Selma. And it's a really a great thing. This was uh, renewed uh, by every administration for years. Uh, very popular with Congress, very popular with the people, very popular with all the presidents since 1965, uh, up until you know, now. Uh, and it really uh, pr provided that the federal courts and the Justice Department would really take measures against Southern states if they tried all this nonsense to try to keep people from voting. The grandfather clauses, and you circled it, you didn't underline it, and you know, all these kinds of things. So an important act. Congress also passed two other acts, the National Voter Registration Act and the Help America Vote Act, to try to make it easier for people to vote. One provision is that instead of having to you know, line up separately to, to um, register to vote, you could just register to vote when you got your driver's license. You know, just think that made it a little easier to get to vote. Well, didn't quite do the trick because there are still other things that the states are allowed to do. Have you heard about felon disenfranchisement? Okay, so this is the map on that and a number of different states and this started during Reconstruction. It was a gimmick. It was another way to keep the former slaves from voting. And what the states would do is they would say, if you're convicted of a felony, you can't vote. And then what would they do? They would get the former slaves convicted of a felony. One way they did this was by having vague laws, like vagrancy laws. So you could be arrested for a crime for having no apparent way to support yourself. And then you were a criminal and then you couldn't vote. You all know too, I'm sure, that we have a lot of issues about racial inequity and criminal prosecutions. So if you look at these criminal disenfranchisement laws, it looks like they're race neutral. But tremendous impact here, 6.1 million Americans cannot vote because of a felony conviction. But look at the impact there. One of every 13 African Americans has lost their voting rights due to felony disenfranchisement versus one in every 56 non-black voters. If it hadn't been for felon disenfranchisement laws, Al Gore would have been president, Hillary Clinton would be president, no doubt about it. Because you know, people who were denied their right to vote in places like Florida would have been able to vote. Uh, here, the Supreme Court has not done anything about this situation. Congress, there have been bills proposed a number of times in Congress to prohibit states from doing this, but they've never gotten any place. And again, you have to look at who's advantaged. The general theory uh, of, is that the more people who vote, the better that is for the Democrats. So the Republicans are always looking to keep down the number of people who are voting, particularly among minorities, racial minorities, and among the poor, who are generally correlated with being Democratic voters. So in 2008, 
when Barack Obama was elected president, the United States had the most diverse electorate in United States history. There were a lot of people who, you know, thanks to the Registration Acts and the Voting Rights Act, were able to vote, and they did. They came out and voted for Barack Obama. In between 2011 and 2012, 27 measures were passed or implemented in 19 states to make it harder to vote. What a coincidence. All of a sudden, there were these laws being shopped around from state to state. Things like, and this is more complicated than you can read, things like voter ID laws. You have to have you know, proof of your identification to come to the polls. Reason for that, oh, to prevent voter fraud. Is there any voter fraud? Well, no, but there could be. So, you know, that's a legitimate thing to do. Preventing early voting. Who tended to vote early? Racial minorities, poor people, people who can't you know, take the day off of work because election day is in the holiday. Voter registration, let's make it hard to do instead of easy to do. Why have automatic registration? Why not make it hard? The rules that Florida came up with were so burdensome that the League of Women Voters, which had always taken on the responsibility for helping women and then everyone to register, pulled out of registering people in Florida because they thought that their staff members were going to be convicted of crimes for you know, running afoul of these very complicated and completely unfair laws. Uh, Okay, so it turns out th there was somebody in Wisconsin who just did a study of, oh, and the Supreme Court has allowed this. This is a case where the ACLU challenged. They said, wait a minute, how can Indiana have this voter ID law that requires people to have IDs in order to prevent fraud that just doesn't exist? And the Supreme Court said, oh, you know, whatever, they get to decide. So um, somebody did a study, a professor did a study in Wisconsin of the actual turnout on the, the effects of the 2016 Wisconsin presidential election. And they found that 11.2% of eligible reg registrants who didn't vote were deterred by the voter ID law. 80% of those deterred from casting ballots in 2016 had voted in 2012, but you know, the obstacles were raised there. Three times as many low income registrants were deterred and more than three times as many African Americans were deterred. Uh, so, um, the, one more case, the Supreme Court, and this is in 2013, uh, cut the legs out from under the Voting Rights Act. And their concern these days is that they thought that the, voter, the Voting Rights Act was unfair to the state of Alabama, because we're assuming that Alabama still would be up to you know, voter discrimination left to themselves. And it's much more important, of course, to be fair to the states and their dignity than it is to be fair to minority voters. So what President Trump has done on this score is he has appointed what he calls a Presidential Advisory Commission on Election Integrity, chaired by Chris Kobach, who used to be the Kansas Secretary of State. He's the vice chair. Uh, what is this commission supposed to be doing? It's extremely transparent. They're almost all Republicans there, and that's what the commission is designed to prove. Okay, Donald Trump says he actually would have won the electoral vote, except for all those millions of people who voted illegally. Those are, I might say, alternative facts. But in order to have the alternative facts, choosing, uh, choosing Chris Kobach is a pretty crafty choice because what he was trying to do in Kansas was to undermine the National Voter Registration Act and prevent people from voting by having all these voter restriction laws. The ACLU sued him. We won. But there is Chris Kobach. I say uh, sometimes when I'm not being directly quoted that I think putting Chris Kobach in front of the Election Integrity Commission is sort of like putting a germ in charge of running your hospital. Um, so the one more thing that I want to show you, getting back to the slide that you didn't see while we were kind of off slides here, is that there is in fact a correlation between political party and views about racial equity. So if you look at this, the blue line is you know, Democrats who think that the country needs to continue making changes to give blacks equal rights with white. 81% of Democrats say yes, they agree with that. Only 36% of Republicans say that. Wide partisan gap and views of racism as a big problem grows even wider, racial differences persist. Well, I've just shown you a number of different ways in which there have been so many thumbs on the scale that when you look at the people who have been elected, the, presumably the Republicans who believe that we don't have a problem with racial equality, that that's just all in the past, that we have moved on, we don't need to do anything, in fact the real problem is voter fraud. Those are the people who are now in power. So one of the ACLU's main initiatives right now is in addition to litigating, 
we are getting into the community organizing business. So we have a thing called People Power, which some of you might like to check out you know, online at you know, peoplepower.org. And we had the launch in uh, Miami Town Hall, and over a million people have watched the launch so far. Our current initiative is to try to get people out there in all the states just trying to help more people to vote, supporting a ballot initiative to restore voting rights to um, 1.6 million Floridians who were you know, disenfranchised because they, convicted, they were convicted of felonies, pushing for independent redistricting commissions, um, pushing back against narrow voter identification laws, uh, et cetera. So tremendously important race. But if you look at all the thumbs on the scale that I've just described to you, that means that to get back to a place where we have a president or a Congress or administrations in most of the states that are friendly to human rights and civil rights and civil liberties, you need a super majority. It's not enough to have a majority. There are a lot of thumbs on the scale. OK, so that's how that happened. So we have democratic inequality so far and racial inequality. So if I haven't yet convinced you of my Americans are not that good at equality, and we're actually not that good at democracy, economic inequality. Charles Beard, who wrote this very interesting book, An Economic Interpretation of the Constitution, points out that the framers of the Constitution, in addition to being all white men, were white men of property. Not all of them were very wealthy. But he said, you know, they wrote a Constitution that favored themselves. There's no talk about economic equality in the Constitution at all, the American Constitution, but there is a lot of protection for private property. This is what we call the takings clause, for example, in the Fifth Amendment. Private property cannot be taken for public use without just compensation. That's a problem when it comes to urban renewal. It was also a problem when it came to uh, getting rid of slavery, because what would have happened was Congress would have had to raise enough tax dollars to pay all the slave owners for their, quote, property in order to end the Civil War. So there are a lot of protections of private property. Again, no um, talk about inequality in the cost economic inequality. Contrast that with the South African Constitution, right? So here is a part of the South African Constitution which says, one of the values of South Africa is to improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. Are they always great at it? Not necessarily, but you know, it's in there. It's one of their important national values. So. Um, we have a lot of questions in the United States about whether the fact that we don't mention economic inequality uh, is what actually leads us down that road. But you think about how the United States is structured, the government is structured. I just told you that what's different about our House and our Senate is whether the states dominate or the popular vote dominates. Um, any talk about minorities having a say? No. Any talk about a House of Commons and a House of Lords? Another kind of formulation that a lot of countries use, Pay some, you're paying some attention to class. Uh, the United States acts as we act as if, many of us, as if racial inequality does not exist. We also act as if economic inequality does not exist in any way that matters. The American myth is anybody, you know, the American dream, anybody can make a million dollars and become president. What's the problem? You know, look at this one person who was poor and grew up to have a lot of money or succeed. However, uh, we're now told in the United States that the top 10% of wealthy people in the country own 77% on the, of the wealth. So we are becoming more economically unequal. Very interesting recent book by this professor at Vanderbilt uh, Law School who talks about the fact that he thinks that the Constitution was not necessarily designed for the wealthy, but it was designed by and for the middle class. And he thinks that the shrinking of the middle class in the United States is a serious threat so you hear a lot about the impact of wealth in the United States on politics and on everything else. So Donald Trump, who campaigned as a populist, I'm sure you know the people who are in his cabinet are an extraordinarily wealthy group of people. There are several billionaires and a number of people who are multi, multi-millionaires. And those members of the cabinet, some of them who are not billionaires, like to act as if they were. <laughs> you know, they like to fly in private jets and spend a lot of taxpayer dollars. Um, you know, imagining that they did have the wherewithal to have that kind of lifestyle. Now, um, as our Constitution has been interpreted, and I once read an article suggesting that I don't think this necessarily had to be the case, but our Constitution has been interpreted as guaranteeing no socioeconomic rights, in terms of you know, no right to have the government help you out at all. There have been a few places where the Supreme Court has found, um, you know, a while ago, has found that you need to do something to equalize uh, the, the opportunities or the um, disadvantages that the poor people have. The one of the most famous in 1963, the Supreme Court decided a case called Gideon versus Wainwright, 
which says if you're charged with a crime and you're too poor to afford a lawyer, the state has to appoint a lawyer for you. That's just not fair to charge somebody with a crime and they can't afford a lawyer, so they're going to be convicted because they don't know how to defend themselves. So that was great and it's complicated. However, our criminal justice system is just as difficult on poor people as it is on um, racial minorities. So one example here that I've highlighted, I could have unfortunately given you many, many examples of this, but in South Carolina, among other places, the ACLU is litigating uh, states that tell people who have traffic fines, a bunch of traffic fines, that they're going to go to jail unless they immediately pay the entire amount of outstanding fines and fees, right up front, right in full. Okay, could you do that? <laughs> if you had you know, more than two traffic tickets. So the problem is that the people who uh, are locked up because of these policies don't have the money to pay the fines immediately. So I think it's fair to say that these laws really act as debtor's prisons. There are a number of places, if you've heard of Ferguson, Missouri, one of the things that was happening in that town was that the police were raising their, their money to run things on by fining people. And tremendous inequity, the fines usually ended up being imposed on people who were racial minorities, people who were poor, and that's how you know, government was being funded. Uh, so, big problem with uh, economic inequality. So, what is the Trump administration doing? Doubling down on economic inequality. In addition to rolling back economic and other protections for the poor, uh, the, the Trump administration is also really pulling back on any sort of protections of workers. These days, you know, the, the um, name of the game is come down on the unions, come down on the workers, and do things that favor not only interests of the wealthy, but the interests of big business. So I'm sure you all know that Puerto Rico had really serious uh, you know, hurricane damage done. And there was this law called the, the Jones Act that got in the way, because the Jones Act required that only American flag ships could deliver you know, goods or you know, things to Puerto Rico. So President Trump was asked to suspend the Jones Act so other ships could also help the people in Puerto Rico. And what he said is, well, you know, we have a lot of shippers there who don't want to do that. They want to make their money. So you know, he did suspend the Jones Act briefly, but that again, it shows you, you know, the government is you know, siding a fair amount of the time on the side of the, the shippers, you know, the big businesses, rather than the individual people. Now here too, attitudes toward what the government should do about poverty correlate with political affiliation. So if you look at this bottom one here, it says um, the percentage of people who say the government should do more to help needy Americans, even if it means going more deeply into debt, 71% of Democrats agree with that, only 24% of Republicans. Um, widening party gap and views of increased government aid to the needy, Percentage of people who say poor people have hard lives because government benefits don't go on far enough, as opposed to it's their own fault you know, if they're poor. So again, a tremendous um, a kind of hardening of American attitudes about poverty and about the, uh, whether or not it's appropriate for the government to do something to promote uh, uh, minimizing economic inequality. Okay, so so far what I've told you about is all these liberties. We're pretty good at liberty. We're not so good at equality. We have problems in a number of different ways. And I think that there is a strong connection between these inequalities and the existence of human rights. I gave you a few examples of how the Republicans who have been voted into office right now in an extremely polarized climate are tending to oppose civil liberties, human rights, you know, measures to try to fight inequality. And again, happy to give you many more examples if you want during the Q&A. But I think that, you know, I would say, um, you know, proposition you know, <laughs> number three is that, I think that democracy is a precondition for human rights. Right, and the turn to authoritarianism that you see in the United States is not only the United States. You see similar reactions in a lot of other countries that I'm sure many of you could point to. And the more countries move in that authoritarian direction, cutting down on liberty maybe, cutting down on equality, cutting down on the idea that the government needs to actually help people and do any sort of affirmative work, the more you're going to have human rights problems. Okay, so that's my proposition about the connection between you know, whether human rights can flourish in an atmosphere where you don't have democratic equality and liberty. 
So uh, that's all pretty depressing so far, right? <laughs> it's really depressing for those of us in the United States because people keep talking about, well, what's going to happen in 2018? What's going to happen in 2020 in the next elections? Can we take back the country? Because we know, you just saw the charts, that a supermajority of Americans really don't like what's going on. And then somebody else writes an article to say, you're dreaming. How's that going to happen? Look at all the thumbs on the scale. You know, look at how hard this is going to be. So I think that it is true that we are going to need a supermajority to have any sort of regime change in the United States, um, either in the federal government or in a number of different states. But here's the good news. I think that a supermajority might just be possible. <coughs> and where I think, here's I think the spoiler. So we were talking about liberty, equality. And I think that the deciding force here might be fraternity. And I think that we are on the track of a new American definition of fraternity. I was telling you that we just don't, uh, you know, the Americans, you could not get an American to agree with the French that it's more important to be you know, of, of one point of view and be a communitarian as opposed to being an individual. Americans are very individualistic. But Americans also believe that they believe in equality. And I think there's a different sense of fraternity going on right now in terms of being a support, a moral support to people of all different groups. So you may be aware of the fact that after President Trump issued his first travel ban, you know, the first let's be mean to immigrants and keep them the, out of the United States order, people spontaneously showed up at airports around the country just to protest. Just ordinary people you know, picked up on Saturday and said, I'm going to the airport. You know, I'm just going to put up a sign saying, let them in. I love my Muslim neighbors. It was remarkable. Just yeah, thousands of people, an outpouring all around the country. Some of this is a reaction to the fact that what the Trump administration is doing, and these are just the president's tweets, the president is um, into demonizing people, groups of people. And that too, I think, is one of the pillars of anti-authoritarianism. Of, of, of to divide and conquer, you convince people that their neighbors are really their enemies and that they shouldn't mind having those people be disadvantaged because then they're going to do better. If somebody else is suffering, then you're going to come out on top. If someone else is kept out of the country, then you're likely to do better. Well, the president talks about Mexicans, he talks about Muslims, he talks about transgender people, he talks about all sorts of people. And the goal here is to convince us to hate each other. Is he having some success? Yes. The number of hate crimes around the United States is up against people on the basis of race, against Muslims, against Jews. So there are people, I'm sure you've heard about the growth of white supremacy. And some of this, when you have somebody in the White House who at least is dog whistling about white supremacists and encouraging them to say what they think and to come out and demonstrate, you are going to have an increase in hate. But a majority of the American people are not there, and they're fighting back. So this is one of the 14 lawsuits that the ACLU brought to challenge that travel ban, the one that prohibited people from different countries from coming into the United States. Um, actually, let me pause and tell you a little story about that, because this isn't this case. It's the other case where we won our first um, injunction, the first court order against the travel ban. When the president had first this list of people can't come into the country if they're from these seven different countries, Iraq, Iran, Somalia, etc., one of the first people who was caught in the travel ban, Hamid Darwish, was an Iraqi. And um, the ACLU lawyers had been waiting for President Trump to come out with this travel ban because he had said you know, while he was campaigning that he was intending to you know, kind of keep America safe by keeping the Muslims out, they should stay home, etc. And so you know, we were waiting for that. So the, order, the executive order where the president actually issued the travel ban came out Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. OK, you know, this is mean to lawyers, right? Because then they had to stay on, you know, after work and, and kind of figure out what was going on. So the ACLU lawyers had a conference call with a number of other people, uh, lawyers and others, um, who were their allies, to talk about what was in the travel ban, why they thought it was unconstitutional, and what the strategy might be for challenging it. One of those groups, the International Refugee Assistance Project, I thought you might find interesting because it was actually started by Yale Law students and you know, law students who just wanted to help welcome refugees to the country. And they wanted to be part of, you know, if refugees were going to have a hard time, they just wanted to be there if they had legal or any other needs at the airport. So the International Refugee Assistance Project, were actually they were at Kennedy Airport to meet this guy, Hamid Darwish, who was one of the first people you know, who was coming into the country from Iraq. Um, Hamid Darwish was 
as I said, Iraqi, and he was somebody who had worked with the American military. He was a translator. And when the American military, the soldiers would go out wearing all their body armor, he would go out wearing his baseball cap because he wasn't military, he didn't have any body armor. He was credited with saving a number of American lives. And then he and his family, he, his wife and three children, were having some trouble because not everybody in Iraq was happy with them being so pro-American. So he made the very difficult decision that he wanted to emigrate to the United States. He spent two years filling out forms, going to hearings, you know, being vetted. Finally, he gets his visa to come to the United States. He arrives at JFK Airport, and what does he find? The travel ban has gone into effect while he was in the air. Okay, so the lawyers have been on the phone from, you know, seven to nine, trying to figure out their strategy to challenge the travel ban, not realizing that the ban was going to be applied immediately. So at 10 o'clock, somebody from the International Refugee Assistance Project calls up the ACLU lawyers and says, guess what? You know? So the lawyers get together with some students at a Yale Law School clinic, and they spend all night writing papers. They actually you know, filed their papers 6 a.m. Saturday morning in the federal court. During the day, it becomes obvious that they're going to need real you know, temporary you know, orders from the court. So they get a hearing at the end of Saturday, Saturday evening, and by Saturday evening, they had won the first court order against the travel ban. Okay, so that was the case that was going on in New York. Uh, at the same time, there was another case in Maryland, also where one of our lead plaintiffs, was one of the lead complainants, was the International Refugee Assistance Project. But among the other plaintiffs, there were some individuals who had relatives who were being kept out of the country. And then there's this group called HIAS, H-I-A-S. Anybody know what that's for? Okay, it's the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. So you might say, what does this have to do with the Jews? You know, this was really about whether Muslims could come in. Well, the CEO of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society said their organization had been started in 1881 to help Jews who were fleeing pogroms in places like Russia and Eastern Europe. And this is a great quote. He says, we cannot remain silent as Muslim refugees are turned away just for being Muslim just as we could not stand idly by when the U.S. turned away Jewish refugees fleeing Germany during the 1930s and 1940s. Okay? Nice? That's fraternity. Uh, Fred Korematsu, you may have heard of, he was one of the people who challenged the evacuation of Japanese Americans on the West Coast during World War II on the theory that any Japanese American just might be allied with Japan and therefore might be a fifth column and they couldn't be allowed to live in California. So Fred Korematsu challenged that. This is his daughter, Karen. And the, um, the Korematsu Center, which Karen now runs, uh, filed a brief to support, to argue in this w the state of Washington case that the travel ban is pretty much the same kind of thing. It's stereotyping, it's unfair. And I actually have been, you know, I was at a, a, a dinner of the Japanese American Bar Association where, you know, there were 600 people there who all wanted to say, we want to do whatever we can to say, you know, can we please learn from the past? Look at what happened to our people. Don't let it happen again. You know, we don't care that these are Muslims and we were Japanese Americans. Just don't let it happen again. Businesses. These are tech and other companies that also filed friend of the court briefs in the travel ban cases, saying this is something that's affecting our employees, it's affecting our companies, this is not American, we think that this is unconstitutional. And here's a list of some of the companies that signed that brief, everyone from Airbnb and Apple down to Zynga. So I think that's very nice too. We're also seeing businesses really rising to the defense of human rights. Um, you may know that the National Basketball Association protested in North Carolina when North Carolina was about to have a transgender bathroom bill. You know, let's be mean to transgender people. And the, the NBA, the Basketball Association, said, okay, you know, you do that, we're not going to play in North Carolina. Yeah, that kind of thing really helps. You hit them in the sports, you hit them in the business. And so people are rising up. Evangelical Christians. You know, hundreds of them signed uh, letters to the president and vice president saying this is not American to fail to support refugees, to be mean to immigrants. You know, don't do it in the name of Christianity any more than American. And one of the nicest stories is here are two uh, Muslim activists who um, are raise money, so these are philanthropists, who uh, started a launch good campaign to raise money to repair a Jewish cemetery that had been vandalized in, in Missouri. Okay, so, you know, I think these stories are really beautiful. You know, people beginning to rise up and um, support one another. And so this is my idea that this is kind of the new American version of fraternity. So I was starting out by saying that, you know, when you look at the French liberty, equality, fraternity, 
at first it looks like, well, you know, the Americans don't do fraternity because we're not all trying to be the same. We don't really believe in community. But I think that we are on the verge of a new definition of fraternity, which is really about a multicultural fraternity and really speaking up on behalf of a multicultural vision of America. So I wanted to end the sort of formal speaking part of my speech by talking, I've talked about law and philanthropy and the people rising up and go to the airports, but since I also have the law and literature part of me, I thought I would end by telling you about a few efforts of artists to try to build this kind of new vision of America, this kind of fraternal America. Um, first example I'll give you, which I thought was really nice, is the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, right after the travel ban, they planned a special show that consisted only of art that was made by immigrants. Okay, they put, kind of pulled things out of their collection and said, okay, you know, here's, here's what immigrants have given to us. Here's their art. Uh, a second example of an artist, one of my favorites, is a 12-year-old girl who lives in New York City who is a cartoonist. And she started a project to raise money for the ACLU that she called Everyday Superheroes. And what she would do is people would commission her to do an everyday superhero caricature of themselves. And she would ask you three questions. What's your favorite color? Tell me something about you that you want in the picture. And cape or no cape? So I, I actually didn't bring a picture, but she did a caricature of me. And of course, I said yes to the cape. <laughs> uh, but she, you know, just by doing this, you know, commission after commission, she raised over $11,000 for the ACLU. So this is, again, you know, the kind of the people doing it themselves, not waiting for the government to be there, just supporting each other. And I thought a nice place to end, I was seeing in the theater ads that what you're getting in London next month is, well, Hamilton. Okay, so Lin-Manuel Miranda, I think is quite brilliant in reframing American history. So we're not only talking about a future where America could be a multicultural fraternity, but Miranda's vision is the founders as a band of brothers who were not just white men, but who were immigrants, who were scrappy, one of the most popular lines when we saw this show in New York is the uh, Marquis de Lafayette, who's of course from France, and um, Alex Alexander Hamilton, who was born in the Caribbean, get together and they say, immigrants, we get the job done. So the whole idea that the founders of the United States are being recast as not just white men, but being identified for things other than their whiteness and their maleness, some of the actors are women. There's um, to the left there, you have David Diggs, African American playing Thomas Jefferson, to the right, you have Lin-Manuel Miranda, who is Puerto Rican, playing Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> so I think the whole idea of re-visualizing the United States as a multicultural place where the founding brothers are truly a fraternity. And it didn't really matter what races they were. What matters is what America could be. So I think that the lesson here, maybe, is that maybe the French are right. And maybe you cannot really have liberty and equality without fraternity of some sort. And in my new definition of fraternity, I think it's not just multicultural, providing support for one another, as opposed to trying to all be the same, but recognizing and including one another despite differences. I think that fraternity is what also needs to happen for us to get past the hyperpolarization of American politics right now. It used to be that people respected each other enough to say, well, I don't agree with what you're doing, but you, know, you were elected president, so you know, let's all vote to do it your way. Supreme Court justices used to be confirmed unanimously by the Senate, Antonin Scalia with 96 to nothing. You know, just all the senators would say, okay, he's smart, he's not what we would have picked. Now everything is so hyperpolarized that what you hear around Washington is that it's impossible to govern because there is no civility. It's just, you know, winner takes all. Yeah, hyper partisan, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah, I'm not going to include you. I'm gonna, if I win, I'm going to win, and that's it. And that's Trumpism to me. That's, you know, 36% people, 36 of the people approve of what I'm doing, but there's a 36% who I need to get reelected, and therefore I don't care about anybody else. Okay, that's not just about liberty and equality. That to me is about a lack of fraternity, a lack of caring about including everybody else in your society, not to be the same, but to be inclusive. So I think that the success of this vision of fraternity, which I hope that I'm right in beginning to see in the United States, will in fact affect the future of civil liberties and human rights in the United States and perhaps elsewhere in the world, because we need for that to happen. So thank you. Thank you.